Yeah, sure. So I see somebody running up the hill. He looks like he could be Canadian to me. Yeah, I think he is Canadian. <laughs> Hi, Shane. If you can just uh, come up and join us on the platform. <laughs> so, I'd like to, to thank you all here. If you might want to come a little bit further forward, um, unless you're sort of wondering whether you're going to stay or not, and it's one of those interesting things that's going on. This is all going to be about, it's called unconscious here, um, which is what a few people were, I guess, last night. But this is a different sort of unconscious. This is um, the, the emotional. We've heard over the last two days a lot about how much decision-making is emotional, how much of it is not rationalized um, or is actually irrational. Um, so we need to find it in different ways. And we've got four people here, all of whom are experts at finding alternatives to simply asking people straightforward questions and working out what's going on. So we're, I'm going to call it neuro stuff, so we don't get hung up on words like science and marketing. And I'm going to ask each of the panel members, starting with Shane over there, just to introduce yourself and say a little bit about what your company does to get at this unconscious, emotional, underneath material. Yes, it's your name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's over here, Shane. <laughs> just checking that we're all here. Thank you all for coming, by the way, too. Um, so hi, I'm, uh, I'm Shane. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Hot Specs. A lot of focus on measuring the subconscious to understand why people really do the things they do. Ray asked me a great question at lunch, which was to make it practical for, for people. And it's exactly the right way. I love that you make it practical. And how does this grow brands and businesses? And so the case I want to share with you, because this is actually important for you and your lives, even outside market research, has to do with pharmaceuticals. And so about four years ago, five years ago, we had a pharmaceutical client who, based on the clinical trials of a new breast cancer drug that they created, that drug, when it hit the market, based on pure science, the scientific clinical trials, which are very, very well designed to be very predictive of what will happen in market, it should have gotten a 17% market share and saved millions of people's lives around the world. They launched it, and alas, it only had a 3% market share. So lots of qualitative research, lots of quantitative research to understand why these doctors, these oncologists, who should be reading the science and making very specific rational decisions about what drug to prescribe to their patients to save their lives, why they weren't doing it. We have a methodology that I don't have any slides, so I can't really show it to you, but it does get at the underlying drivers of behavior and into emotions. We applied this methodology to this drug and to the competitive set, and what we found was about 50% of the reason why doctors, oncologists, 50% of why the reason why they write certain prescriptions has to do with how they feel or what their emotions or subconscious are telling them about that act specific medical drug or molecule as they call it. And so what we helped our client do was actually reposition the drug out of one emotional space, and I'll call it, for lack of a better word, sort of the aggressive leadership, um, male-dominated space of being the best in the market to a more fem feminine, nurturing space, change the color, change the name, change the whole way that the representatives went to talk to the doctors, and the market share within nine months went up quite significantly, actually about 14.5%. And so why I give that example, and I'm almost done, right? Why I give that example is two reasons. One is that even doctors who you think should be completely rational in the things that they do, about 50% of the reason why they do the, why they make the decisions about pres drugs they prescribe is emotional. And the other most important reason, I hope you remember this until the end of time, is that whenever you're getting medical advice, always get a second opinion. Because you never know what drug rep has just been in to see your doctor, or how pretty she looked, or how good looking he was, or what dinner they went to. But dr even doctors can be swayed in their subconscious based on different marketing activities. But Shane, just give us a hint about what you do to collect the data. Great point. So we collect the data. We actually use, there's lots of different ways to, uh, to collect data. We've experimented with, with faces, with pictures. Uh, we've even done some neuro stuff to actually align our stuff with neuro stuff. We're a big fan of actually sort of using equipment to measure what's going on inside a brain. We've actually, through a lot of R&D, developed a model that just, just uses words, believe it or not. You know, words have been working for millennia. They still work quite well if you present the people in such a way where they can decode 
what they're feeling using words. If you think about what emotion is for a minute, and everyone has been talking a lot about emotion at this conference, lots of different perspectives on it. The one we like the best is actually that an emotion is actually a chemical reaction happening inside your body. So when you're feeling stress, it's actually something called norepinephrine flowing through your body, plugging into your different cells. If it's an eye cell, it causes it to focus better. If it's a lung cell to breathe faster, a heart cell to beat faster. Our word for that is stress. And when you show someone a word that says stress, they can all do a very good job of saying, yes, I'm actually feeling stress. So we actually started out with 5,000 different emotional states and narrowed it down to a list of 96 that we found to be incredibly applicable around the world. We've played in the last 20, uh, 24 months, we've done research in 36 different countries. Emotions are universal. Someone in Australia, if they're feeling stress, is the same way as someone feeling stress in Hong Kong. It's neuro norepinephrine flowing through their body, and if you put the word stress in front of them, they can do a pretty good job saying, yes, I'm actually feeling that right now. And one of the advantages of this, as part of this, this, the na name of this talk, is that it is quite scalable across multiple platforms, including web and mobile. And as we all know, mobile's going to be very important. Anders, if you could do the same sort of introduction job. Sure, I can try. Uh, so I'm Anders Bengtsson, next to Shane on the slide as well. Um, CEO of Protobrand, uh, we specialize in online metaphor elicitation. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a technique that uses images and metaphors to reveal people's deep-seated thoughts and feelings. Uh, thoughts, feelings, emotions, motivations that people can't readily articulate in a plain conversation where they get a, a direct question, whether it's a focus group or an online survey. Uh, so this technique has been around for 20, 25 years. It was originally pioneered by Jerry Zaltman, Harvard professor. Uh, Protoband has pioneered this, doing it online. And of course, online, what that makes is that it, it means speed, it means uh, uh, scalability on a global scale, and we can talk more about that later. Uh, we have our image library, which is part of our uh, process, has been tested uh, in, in, uh, in multiple cu cultures so that we know is culturally eclectic and can be used to elicit deep-seated thoughts and feelings. Um, to give you a sense of what this can do for you in terms of a research application, I'll give you an example of the way we help Bank of America in the US uh, to understand why people don't uh, um, save for retirement. So obviously, saving for retirement is particularly important in, in the US, given the relatively modest uh, 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 retirement system. Uh, and there are many barriers to that. And the barriers are oftentimes hidden to people. When you ask in a, in a, in a direct question, people will come up with all sorts of reasons that, well, I don't have enough money. But that's really not the underlying reason why people are not, not saving. So um, identifying the metaphors that are kind of the roadblocks to people saving uh, was really powerful here for the client and helped us to position their service. And this was Merrill Lynch, uh, that is an online platform for saving uh, for retirement, was instrumental in helping them position this brand. Excellent. And Caroline. Yes, I am a managing partner with Norensix USA. Norensix is based here in Amsterdam. And we do brain scans to look inside the living brain. So has anybody here had an MRI where you go in the big machine? You know what I'm talking about? Exactly. Same thing for the brain. Um, so that's our methodology. What we've done is adapted um, a very hardcore scientific tool to marketing. And we've extracted ways to measure neural networks for 13 different emotions and dimensions, so everything from trust, familiarity, anger, fear, etc. cetera. Uh, so it's a very rich output. Uh, it gets deep inside to the brain how you're feeling or thinking about a product or service. And for an example of a case study, we recently did a study for a Dutch company, a mortgage company called Hypotecker. And recently there was a change in uh, legislation so that mor mortgage companies here have to sell more directly to consumers. So Hypotecker came to Norensix and said, can you help us with positioning that will attract people uh, very clearly and strongly to our brand? So we tested three different messaging propositions for them. And they varied in terms of how much they tried to promote fear, um, those types of things. When you're selling a mortgage product, of course, you have to address the concept of, I'm scared I might lose my mortgage, right? Um, but they found that the messages, we found for them, that the messages that were much more positive and had a much bigger balance of positive emotions uh, was much more powerful. They went ahead with that messaging and their market share jumped. They're now number one in market and very happy with the results. And Jeremy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I actually have a quick story about pharmaceutical research before I uh, jump into my introduction. So one of our pharmaceutical clients, um, all the doctors that they work with um, were complaining about how the reps didn't know enough. 
and it was causing some problems on their practices. They didn't know if they were prescribing the right things. So they talked to all the companies, and particularly to our client, about this issue. So the company made sweeping changes, and they replaced all of the reps, and I don't know if it's the same as out here, but at the time, the reps, and uh, Shane sort of alluded to it, the reps tend to be young and attractive women in the US, so they replaced all the reps with a bunch of dudes, and, and, and women who were a little bit older and actually had more knowledge. And within about a day and a half, there was about 150 calls to the company uh, asking them to switch back. <laughs> so um, again, similar point. Doctors, not always rational, sometimes emotional, and driven by uh, other, you know, other characteristics. So uh, I am uh, Jeremy Sack. I'm a vice president and general manager at LRW, Lieberman Research Worldwide. Um, we're not a, uh, a, a brain science company. Um, our motto is, so what? We solve client business problems. We're actually more like a, a management consultancy. Uh, I'm a general manager there. I have clients. I use all sorts of different techniques, including uh, traditional techniques, choice models, segmentations, all of those things. Uh, my background is I have a PhD in social psychology, so I used to do all sorts of measurement of emotions and non-conscious and uh, all the various things you've heard about here. And ultimately what I found was there was a need with my clients uh, to get at some of these processes similar to uh, the other panelists up here. So what we have is a set of approaches and techniques, which I'll talk uh, in a second about, that can be integrated in with traditional uh, techniques that get used today. And I actually think one of the, one of the things that uh, maybe it was unstated, but it kind of felt a little bit missing in, in, in some of the, the conferences uh, and, the, and the presentations is that, you know, ultimately as important as emotions are and non-conscious things are, most decisions include all sorts of different processes, including conscious and rational processes. So our general approach is to say you want to measure all of it so you have a holistic perspective, and that lets you do sophisticated analysis such as what part of people's and consumers' responses to this product are rational, which parts are emotional, what should we market to with information, what should we market to with tone, um, and so on and so forth. So our approach tends to be much more uh, uh, integrated. Um, in terms of specific approaches, we have a set of various techniques, most of which have been inspired by social psychology and cognitive psychology. We have approaches uh, that use reaction time to uh, you know, understand associations in the mind. Uh, using, uh, it's all online, all scalable, using mobile or computers. We have measures of identity. So this is, I talked about this in my talk a little bit yesterday. This is the incorporation of the brand into the self. This is a dynamic image task, and it's been shown to be more predictive of real world behavior than uh, other approaches. Um, we have a quantitative projective test that puts the brand in the scene that it would be in in real life and sees all of the inferences that people draw that you wouldn't pick up with other techniques. Um, and then we also have a few uh, other ones as well. Uh, if I was going to do a real case study, super fast, since the intro took 12 minutes. Yeah, let's go to um, uh, Super fast case study, and, but I think it makes one of these points well. Uh, we had a client, technology brand, was uh, about to make a huge investment uh, based on some choice modeling research they had done. And basically it was going to be entering a new category. The choice model research said their brand could go into this big category and be the number two player and be a basically a really fairly extensive and dominant force other than obviously the leader. Um, they were a little nervous about it, so they did some work with us using our quantitative projective test, and it actually picked up all sorts of uh, issues that were sort of lurking underneath the surface in the marketplace. Um, they then decided to just sort of take a little trial run uh, in a particular market and produce some prototypes anyway, and uh, basically, that's exactly what happened. Uh, the consumers had major issues with it, but none of that was picked up with the, with the traditional choice approach. Anders, you're looking it, tense. I just wanted to comment quickly and say, I couldn't be emphasized more the importance of actually combining the subconscious with the cognitive, the conscious mind. Uh, oftentimes, we tend to discuss these as it's, it's a dichotomy. Okay, now we do traditional research, now we do the research that is about the subconscious, the non-conscious, or the unconscious. Uh, but really, the important thing I think everyone should ask themselves when they do a research product, does it address both and at the same time? Both the conscious mind and the subconscious, unconscious, and triangulating the data between the two. That's really the key, and not treat them as two separate studies. That's what, what I think the real opportunity here is in, in this area. So a couple of quick questions. For us. How many of you, even research worldwide, brought us that wonderful head scan that says, did you all get to go 
on the virtual reality. Anybody not have a go? Good, because you'd have really missed that. I thought that was, that was fantastic, and, and big applause to them for bringing it. They should have got a bit more branding in there. I'd, if yeah. I'd been doing it, I have to say, that uh, platform would have had my brand name across the top, and it would have, on the way down, it would have had a bit of brand name in there, but then that's just me. How many people here do neuro stuff as part of their regular business? John and, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's, we've got some, so I expect to hear something back from the floor um, in terms of, of some of these issues. Now, we headed this up about scaling because a lot of the techniques involved around seeking out to understand the emotion are labor intensive. And clients can sometimes fall in love with them, say a Unilever, and they say, that's great, we'd like to do that for 10 products in 30 countries. And we've got a quite a lot of money, and you still can't necessarily do it. So what issues have you had with scaling, and how have you addressed them? So do you want to start us off, Anders? Sure, absolutely. So uh, we have a methodology that uses images, and the image library is consistent across cultures. But as you probably know, images are interpreted different by in, diff in different cultures. Even within the same culture, the same image evokes different meanings and associations. So I think we have to accept one thing, and, and one thing that is not talked about at a lot at this conference is that all research involves interpretation. And we tend to forget that. And even in quantitative research, interpretation is involved. Uh, but we shift the burden to the respondent who needs to interpret a question and, and an answer on a, with a number. And there is in interpretation and ambiguity there. So we can't shy away from the fact that interpretation is always part of research and is always something that limits the scalability. Now, we, do, we make it convenient in quantitative research, but then we reduce the data down to a number and we lose a lot of the context. So if you want to keep uh, some of the texture that you get from qualitative data, which I believe is always a part of research, but finding the right mix between quantitative and quantitative, working with data sets that are, tend to be smaller and faster. So what we do with metaphorical elicitation online is that rather than getting 30 pages of transcript from each person, we get 25 to 100 words. So you can quickly start to analyze data from hundreds of people. And when you do that across markets, it actually becomes a very scalable operation uh, it, when you use our methodology. So are you looking for saturation when you do that analysis? Absolutely. Uh, and you get, uh, for those of you familiar with the traditional z when you did it face-to-face, -face, it was 10, 10, 15 people, but then you would do a three-hour interview. What we tend to do, it's, it's online, so it's a max of 20-minute survey, sometimes just 10 minutes. Uh, and you get, probably in a cell, you have no more than 100 people. And so that's really what you need in order to get saturation uh, to do this online. And that becomes highly scalable, and you don't have to have uh, spend thousands of hours for data analysis, but, but rather it becomes very manageable. But gives you the texture and gives you the richness and deep-seated th thoughts, emotions, and motivations that you can't really get when you ask people to reduce their response to a number. Caroline, I'll come to you once again. I ought to give a heads up to anybody who missed the earlier announcements. On the original schedule, this was going to finish at 6, and then the Fringe Factory kicks off. We're actually staying till 6.20. We're going to miss um, the Fringe Factory. So if anybody wants to disappear in three minutes, you will be <laughs> excused. Um, or now, even, Simon, uh, looking at the bag grabbing. Um, Caroline, fMRI scanners, not the most scalable of tools. No, but that doesn't mean they're not scalable. So the issue of scaling, I'm actually in the industry that is been the hardest to scale. Um, but what does scaling mean? Scaling means that you can perform studies at regular times and you can promise capacity to deliver and it's delivered with replicability and consistency. That's scaling. So do we need to do 10,000 MRI studies for a client? We don't. We don't at all. So I worked previously in NeuroFocus, which conquered the, the nut of scaling EEG research, which was not so easy to scale, but it was done. Um, and I'm going to speak to this because this is relevant to, to fMRI. It was done at uh, NeuroFocus through very good experiment design, very strict protocols, and algorithms that would continually take results that would be the same depending, no matter what the study was, right? Same thing for Norensics. What we've done is we've worked with scientists who understand this is not an academic study, this is a business study. We can't do results in months. They must be done in weeks. So how do we do that? Well, we have to set up experimental designs that are very efficient, very strict, that are followed to the letter for each experiment so that there's no uh, customization, there's no 
um, how do we do this study? How do we set this up? It's the same each time, right? So that's replicating science. And second of all, the algorithms are very solid. They've been benchmarked against the, the FE ads so that we know that they're reliable and we don't have to interpret each study a custom way. We have a, a study that comes out and we're very confident um, that it's real, that that result, if we did that same study with a different group that's the same sample at a different time, we would get the same result. So, you know, the issue, of course, with brain scanning is uh, we're not going to go out and buy $10 million scanners and put them in our backyard. So we need to contract with universities and scan centers around the world, uh, which is what we're doing. So we have one here in Amsterdam. We have them in South America now. We're setting them up in North America. And so the very achievable and doable goal is to have a set of scanning centers around the globe um, in key markets um, covering the world in the major markets so that then when clients need something done globally, we've got scanning in Europe, North America, South America, Brazil, and we, ha we understand the schedule there, and we have uh, very firm agreements with the scanning centers and the universities. We know when our capacity is, we know when the times are available, we have trained engineers who can then collect the data very swiftly and efficiently. It's absolutely doable, and we're gonna do it. So Shane. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're lucky in that uh, we use psycholinguistics or language. We're also lucky in that we, we, we work with some very large Fortune 100, even Fortune 50 companies who before they ask you to go and test a package or a design or an ad in 10 countries, they put you through a very rigorous, and in one case, two-year testing process where you had to actually predict in-market sales results with the model before they would actually adopt it as their global standard. The one lesson I can impact upon you, uh, hopefully, is that when you try and take specifically a quant model, ours is very much a quantitative model that predicts actual market share increases from changing your emotional positioning. As you're looking to adapt to local cultures, we've had a lot of success working with qualitative moderators. And so we basically just give them the English version of all of our maps. So we have an emotional layer, a brand personality layer, a rational benefits layer, a values layer, colors layer. There's almost 20 different layers in our maps. And about three moderators, if you separate them, can decode that into the cultural nuances and language that represent those different emotional states in a pretty good, consistent way. I'd say on average they agree about 95% of the time on all these words, and then for the last 5%, we get them all in a room and they fight about it for about an hour, and then we sort of settle on something that, uh, that tends to work quite well. And again, as I said, our model is, uh, because it's words, it's quite easy to use on mobile devices, which is where we see a lot of our research going. In fact, we have another very large global client who's made a statement that 80% of all the research they're going to be doing in the next few years is actually going to be done on mobile devices. So as anything's looking to sort of scale in that way, it's very important that things can be adapted for mobile. And I know, Anders, your, your platform works exceptionally well. Actually, the three of us actually share clients. And I can say our clients are actually th thrilled with the work that both of you do. It's fantastic the way your product actually scales on their mobile device. See, Anders, Anders has a great product because it's actually fun to do because you're looking at pictures. And when you, people are looking at pictures, it doesn't feel like they're actually doing research. So you can actually, I didn't know the survey took 20 minutes. I, that is quite a long time, but well, I guess if it's pictures, it's okay. Well, it's pictures, but remember, again, we're not just doing the, the picture metaphor elicitation. It's also a cognitive question included. So usually no more than 20 minutes, but sometimes as, 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 uh, as short as 10. Yeah, we're going to come to Jeremy in a second, and then we'll throw it over to the questions. Just one thing on the maps. I think, Shane, you're right to give the maps to the local moderators to interpret. I was in a debrief in Tokyo one time. An American researcher doing a fantastic piece of work. They plotted all the drinks and the meats, and they had like orange juice and things over here, and they put this World Health next to it. And on the other side, there were these drinks fortified with caffeine and nicotine and things like this, and they put the word not health next to them. And they said, we're going to call these the not health drinks, and it, the audience really lost them. And I had to explain that the Japanese name for these drinks is Genki drinks. Genki is health. Um, so the word they'd chosen was the opposite word, and it just like disrupted the whole session. I, I, I'm terrified of being in Japan, by the way. That's, um, we're, actually, that's the one marker where we translated our maps. And I hadn't had someone in Japan actually read them yet, and I had the receptionist at the head office at a very large automotive company <laughs> just really quickly go through some of the words, and there was one word on there they felt too embarrassed to say. I won't tell you what the word is. Maybe <laughs> later at the bar I'll tell you what the word is. But th needless to say, these were just on the back of my business cards. I did not hand out those business cards. <laughs> If you ever go to Tokyo, <laughs> very important to make sure you get it triple translated, maybe even four moderators in that specific market. One per business. So, Jeremy. 
Yeah, actually, I mean, because by and large, I agree with everything that these guys have been talking about. I actually talk about a different nuance of scaling okay. that I think gets lost a lot um, and maybe is more germane to the sort of work we're doing versus um, other approaches. But, you know, we're, we're a, we're a full-on custom market research company. So people are coming to us generally for super custom projects, right? We're not doing... Um, and, and, and I don't mean to, uh, this is the shorthand of this, not a bad hand. Not doing a bad like, we're not doing cookie cutter approaches. We're not doing tons of just kind of ad tests, concept tests, these kinds of things. Those are often the approaches that are the easiest to scale in general, and particularly the te techniques, right? Because you can build something that's fairly plug and play that needs to be interpreted brilliantly by people, but because you know the stimuli is gonna be very consistent. So our, you know, people come to us for really hard custom problems. So we're often dealing with very complex issues that are about solving some really specific business decision uh, more so than some of those other approaches. So that requires tools, and this is kind of connecting into the scaling, actually it requires tools that are flexible, right? So what we have are approaches that, and we have our Pragmatic Brain Science Institute, which sort of helps make sure this goes well in our organization. But we have approaches where we're having daily decisions about someone has a business problem, do we think emotions and non-conscious are gonna be particularly relevant? If yes, which approaches should we use? And if so, how do we get that approach in, in a way that's not biased, a way that's appropriate, a way that helps solve that custom business problem, so actually the demands are pretty hard on our internal folks because we're trying to scale to really complex and nuanced research applications. That means you can't be sort of dogmatic on the fact that like I have this tool and it's gonna be used in this way. Okay. Um, so I actually think that's, um, it's a subtle nuance on scaling that I think is really important, which is that if we really believe non-conscious and emotions are so critical that we have to be able to weave that into all the kind of nuanced and complex decisions that our clients have to make. And that requires some really careful decision making around sort of the rigidity of the science versus the flexibility of the approaches. Yep. And um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop to there, Jeremy. Yep. Um, questions? Or I'll let Jeremy come back in. Just joking. No, no. no. Yes, oh, just over here. It's behind you. Um, if neuroscience studies shows that all decisions are made uh, are, are based on emotions, uh, at least to say that uh, all decisions need emotions to be taken, mm -hmm. then and you come to a conclusion that a, a, a business case, business decision uh, needs emotional valuation. How do you evaluate them? And then secondly, how do you know that if you are able to measure in some way the emotions uh, uh, evoked. How do you know that they finally then lead to that sp specific decision? Yeah, that was to me. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. So, I mean, I think um, I agree for sure that uh, most decisions involve an emotional component. But just to give a quick example, um, if someone uh, first buys a product, oftentimes the approach and the reach and the decision is emotional. But after they make the purchase, we all know there's all sorts of post-purchase justification and rationalization. So I walked down the aisle and I bought it because it was shiny and colorful and it made me feel good and then I brought it home and I said, I bought that because I'm a good mom or a good dad. If we're gonna try to predict future purchase, we need to understand whether the things that company is doing are making people feel like good moms or good dads, because the second purchase requires them to have to that part of their identity to be withheld, you know, upheld and consistent. So I think it's never that emotions don't matter, but I actually think we need to think about sort of how much of a decision we think will be sort of emotional versus rational, and that's why we need to measure both. Yeah. So what you call, I call it a little voice in your head. Uh, all marketers know that for the last 50 years is cognitive dissonance, right? Sure. Yep. And, uh, but the decision has been made up front by other mechan uh, uh, mechanical than this little voice in our head, right? The, the, init the initial purchase. Yeah. And scientific studies shows that all 
re repeated uh, uh, decisions on the same product are also based on the same uh, emotions evoked. The only thing that could happen is that, that, that uh, uh, additional knowledge could change an emotion. If, uh, for instance, if you have to learn, if you've learned that you don't like it, what mm -hmm. you bought, or it didn't taste well, then you've got a new information, and a new information set will change your uh, your uh, uh, emotional decision mm -hmm. on uh, on buying or buying not. So, who cares about what your little voice you had, which actually is a totally other part in your brain, which actually is a hundred million years younger mm -hmm. than our decision system? Who cares about what right. little what the little voice said? Okay, so the rest of the, the panel, how do you choose which emotions to focus on and how do you know that you've got to the right bit for this part of the business decision? So, uh, <coughs> um, we have a model, uh, we call it uh, our equalizer model and so we measure 96 emotions, 167 personality attributes and then also typically about 100 rational attributes in any given category. And basic, basically the process implied is we ask how people feel and think about a brand, a product, an ad, an ice cream, a person, and then we ask how likely they are to buy or consume that, maybe a loyalty measure as well too, and then we deduce through mathematics how much each of those different attributes are actually driving their ultimate behavior. We take that across a whole category with a big sample, typically it's between two and 3,000 people, and then our model, our PhD set it up, it runs for about a day and a half, and it runs simulations within that model and it will give us some very specific data out the back to say this cluster of emotions here, if you reposition your brand from this space to that space, that's where you're gonna get maximum market share lift and maximum loyalty. And typically what it gives us is two or three different options because sometimes the clients don't wanna go to the one that the model outputs, but typically there'll be two or three different viable what we call right space candidates. Uh, and then we typically have a workshop with clients to go through our findings decision is made, and then we give them a whole bunch of tools to unpack that emotional space. What does it feel like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? What does it taste like? What should the colors be? What should the ad look like? What should the shopping experience be? Because the more consistent you are in that emotional space across the path of purchase, and after they've actually purchased, you create something called cognitive symmetry. The more symmetrical that brand experience is within a human mind, the more likely people are to remember it, to buy it, to talk about it, and become loyal consumers of that brand. Yeah, sure. Uh, so what we work with metaphor elicitation is to uncover not just emotions, but also metaphors. Because metaphors are essential to how we as humans understand the world and how we think about how things work and how brands are aligned with that system. So for example, when we look at a study at a category level, and I can give you an example, we work with Reebok to map the types of emotions and metaphors that people activate as they engage in sport activities. So we basically developed a whole metaphor map of sport activities and the emotions and the metaphors that are, are uh, associated with those. We then looked at, in that entire universe, where different brands had strong positions. So where would Nike be within that? Where would Adidas be? And where was really the opportunity for Reebok? Because obviously you don't want to go into the same territory. So identifying a white space opportunity based on emotions and metaphors, and, and that's a process that we do based on mapping both brands and the category. Yeah, we don't look for anything particular. We simply look inside the living brain and see what it reveals about, what it feels about an experience. So the power in that is that we have no idea what we're looking for. Um, we haven't told the human being anything about what we're doing. They actually have no idea why they're lying in the scanner other than that they're there for a marketing study. And then they start seeing pictures. So it's a very pure and deep form of how does a brain react emotionally, and some of the measures are cognitive attention and novelty, are two cognitive uh, metrics that we measure. Um, and simply, what's inside the brain? Very deeply, we don't know what we're gonna get. The client doesn't know what they're gonna get. Sometimes we're very surprised by it. Um, often, this type of research shines a bright light on a dark area. So often, a client will bring us in when, frankly, everything else has failed. So they've tried traditional research, they've tried qualitative, Maybe they tried some of these gentlemen's techniques and they're still scratching their heads going, I just don't know what my consumer is thinking. I, I, it's time to go look inside the living brain and find out. Then that information is informed by the research that, they, that they've done and then they get a beautiful picture of, okay, there's, people are saying this and they're doing this, aha, but this is what's in the brain, that's the picture. Okay, I'm just gonna see if there's one more question and after that or if there isn't, 
I'm going to come back and say of everything you've seen in the last two days, which bit do you think you're going to try to work into what you're currently doing? So is, is there what? Yeah, there's a question at the back. So we'll take that first and then we will have that closing question. Hi, I, this is Diana from Trimbeck. Um, I was just wondering what are the main verticals that you serve? Uh, the top three, let's say, industries, and within those industries, what would you say the main channels of communication, like what media in particular do you focus on measuring? Okay, you want to start at um, Jeremy and move along the line? Um, well, we do a lot of technology, do a lot of pharmaceuticals, and a lot of CPG. Those would probably be the first three that come to mind, which we all know mean something also from neuroscience. And then what was the second question? How, how we do it? Oh, cha challenges. The challenges. Ch challenges, gotcha. Um, I mean, I think, it, I think it varies. I mean, I think Shade uh, I, uh, you know, made a reference earlier that's definitely true. I mean, I think when you're doing pharmaceutical, was I wrong? It's not challenges? Yeah, it's cha channels, sorry. Oh, channels. channels. Channels of communication. Yeah, I was about to. I, say I'm Okay, by channels, do you mean um, sales channels, business channels? M marketing channels, like online, print, uh, uh, video. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, it's mostly uh, online and, and mobile. Would be the two. Okay. For collecting, you mean, Diane, you mean collecting the data channels or, or testing communications through different channels? Communications channels. Right. Like, who, what, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, it's. You don't it's, test ads and stuff. You yeah, I mean, we, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, so a, no, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's, you know, typical uh, P's, you know, I mean, we're doing positioning, pricing work, we're doing, you know, marketing communications, you know, we are informing ads and things like that. So, I mean, it's basically the full set. Okay. Yeah. Caroline, then I'm just going to change. Yeah, by far the largest category is uh, consumer goods, followed by, uh, I'd say, mortgage and insurance, health and beauty, some other categories. Um, channels, we test a lot of ads. Clearly, in what we do, we test the video ads. We also test brands. We test packaging, print ads. We can also test interesting things like smell and sound. Super. Yeah, sure. We work across basically all categories. Um, all consumer brands find uh, our application useful, whether you explore at the product level, the category level, or specifically on, on the brand level. Uh, we also do communications testing. You can test all kinds of forms of if it's digital, print, uh, uh, online, etc. Uh, and yes, testing uh, perceptions of, um, of uh, uh, sound and smell through metaphors is something that is really powerful too. So cross-sensing and using metaphors to understand the different stimuli is something we work with as well. Uh, yeah, so very similar. S a CPG, retail, automotive. And actually our most interesting thing we just did was actually a country, the country of Italy. We help the country of Italy reposition themselves into a different emotional space to drive demand for their goods and services around the world. In terms of the challenges, um, I mean, it's all kinds of different stuff. I don't think I could put my finger on just three different things. A lot of brand strategy, a lot of packaging, a lot of ads, a lot of custom stuff as well, too. Probably about 40% of our business is just custom problems. My brand's declining. I don't know why. Competitors launching. Please help. Things like that. Okay, so of everything you've seen in the last two days, the infographics, the behavioral science, the new methods of brainstorming, all the mobile stuff, the gamification, what are you going to take back to see if you can put it into your mix? Yeah, I mean, I actually think the, uh, uh, and some of the folks here are working on it, right? I mean, I actually think language is an area of real richness that's just kind of growing and growing, but has a lot of potential, you know? I mean, so we have ways of collecting uh, open ends verbally online in really large sample sizes through computer microphones and things like that. And I think that sort of all the things that can be done with language and all the things that it means um, is something that I'm gonna continue to sort of push on at LRW. I think that's good, Caroline. One of the most powerful uh, things about our technique of brain scans is its predictive ability. Um, that's been proven in our research so far. We want to continue that. So some of the vendors here have some interesting techniques to go out and, and test uh, behavior in the market, and we plan to continue our database of predictive reliability for our scanning. Super. Anders. 
Yeah, I think uh, uh, going back to the origins of uh, ethnography and the importance of studying consumption in its context, I think that can never be uh, forgotten about. And I think that now with, as all, most research is going mobile, uh, that is just the next opportunity for researchers to really capture the moment when things are happening, because the lab is just not a very good place to study consumption. <laughs> so Shane. Yeah, you know, I feel that long and hard about this, and I, I, I just got to, you know, it feels a little awkward saying it, but the best thing that I want to bring back to the office is actually Jeremy. <laughs> so, uh, Jeremy, I'll be giving you a job offer once you come off the stage <laughs> up here. We live in snowy Canada. I mean, in the summer, it's pretty good. It's probably not uh, what you're used to, typically. Shane, uh, you're in Toronto. We're in Toronto. The summer is not good. It's too hot. <laughs> the winter is not good. It's too cold. There's like a few days in between, which is blissful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but seriously, I, I think, Jeremy, if you want to keep your sort of finger on the pulse of what's really going on in this space, Jeremy's a very good resource for that. I love the Pragmatic Brain Science Institute. I think he's bang on as well, too, with, with voice. And if you think about all the research that's moving to mobile, people aren't going to be filling out open ends on mobile devices. They'll talk into them, and if you can then capture their data and their insights that way and then process it in an interesting way, I really think that uh, that's going to be really important moving forward as well. Yeah, and just to chip in a two penny worth on that, somebody opened my eyes recently that it's not about recording what people say because that just adds to our problem. It's about voice recognition on the mobile, so what you get is data on the mobile. And that is going to make a real difference. Well, we're down to 22 seconds to go. So, big round of applause, or as big as we can manage with the room, please, for the panel. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you for, for being with us. The event is now closed. There is a long list of announcements, which I won't read. Please tweet about this event, blog about this event, talk about it. What was good? What was different? What would you like to see more of? This was the very first of these in Europe, and I think it's been great. Um, I'm delighted that Lenny and the team invited me to be here. I hope that you have found stuff that you want to take away and use as well. So thank you all. Safe journeys home, um, and see you at the next one. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for the AV guys who've done a great job over the last two years, two days. <laughs>